Hello, baby. Hey, we're on. I think it's on. All right. Shall we get started today? Hello, everyone. I'd like to start today with a song. Jimmy and Scott and I have been working barbershop. A lot of people don't know this. We've been working on a Katy Perry song. Uh, <laughs> yeah. that, that one Katy Perry song? Yeah, so why, why don't you start us off? Uh, don't don't do shit. it. No, that's <laughs> yeah. Okay, so welcome everyone to our head to head. In case you don't know uh, who these people are or what's happening, let me just quickly introduce them. This is Scott Allen. Everybody knows Scott Allen. This is Jimmy. He's from Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Yeehaw! Jimmy Boggart. I'm Rob Connery. <laughs> <laughs> I actually so, do have a horse, too. Uh -huh. That's. Here's the idea. Every year at NDC, we try and do something a little bit more fun. And we've been doing what they have been calling cage matches, where we do two competing technologies. But this year, we decided to do something a little different. So I go to Stack Overflow. I grab six or so questions. Uh, today is mostly about .NET. We have an Angular question as well. I give these two guys the questions, and they have to come up with their own answers independently. So we're going to see answers to the same questions, they don't know what each, other, each other's answers are, and then we're going to mix and match and compare and contrast. That's it. Your involvement is actually encouraged. I know being in Norway, you guys are really, really vocal, so I might wander, <laughs> I might wander around, and if you feel me kick you, that means ask these guys a question. So this is going to be hopefully fairly interactive. With that said, Scott, will you start us off? Start us off with the first question. Uh, no, with a song, please. Oh, with a song. <laughs> Katy Perry. I actually don't know any Katy Perry songs. I'm sorry. Is she gangster <laughs> rap? No. Gangster rap. All right. Well, one question Rob sent out to us was about the service point manager dot default connection limit, which maybe you've never heard of this class. But apparently, the fellow who asked this question was had written in a Web API 2 service in .NET Core, and he found this piece of code that set the service point manager dot default connection limit to int dot max value, <laughs> which increases the connection limit, by the way. <laughs> Doesn't know if it's for the computer or the framework, and he just wanted to know how to do this in .NET Core. And I had never actually seen the service point manager. I actually had to go out and do a little research. But I think I know what was behind all of this. I remember when I first started with .NET, I actually wrote an application server side and in ASP.NET, we were trying to make multiple connections from our server to another server. And it turns out there is a connection limit baked into the framework where you can only make two HTTP connections to another server, which makes sense from Microsoft's perspective because they were following the HTTP RFP, the official specification that says you should only make two HTTP connections to another server. But that might be good for web browsers so that web browsers don't overload a server but it's not so good when you have two servers inside the firewall that need to communicate with each, with each other efficiently, and they're handling all sorts of requests from clients. So I remember back then, we used to change the connection limit using a web.config file, which doesn't exist in core as yet. It's making a comeback. Uh, probably. Well, there was a project.json file, but now there's a csproj file too, so we're, yeah, we're not sure. Uh, anyway, for this one, I, I did come up with a really quick, simple little piece of code that appears to do what this gentleman would like to do, which is from a .NET Core application like this, you'll probably be using HTTP client. And if you pass in a special message handler that is a win HTTP handler into this, you can set max connections per server to whatever you want. Uh, I guess the question there, would a win HTTP handler be available on a non-Windows operating system that I don't know? Some of us have more experience trying to uh, port things to different environments than I do, but I don't know. What does Jimmy think? Um, I actually I think I have a more elegant answer than yours. Obviously. <laughs> So I'm a consultant, so I'm always looking for the, the question behind the question, and maybe mm. the question behind that one as well. Uh, so this guy, he looks like he's, uh, or gal, no, Bilal, I don't know, okay. person, uh, is, is trying to have more concurrent connections uh, in .NET. Uh, so I think that he's, uh, he, his problem can be more simply solved. I got a gist here going here. Uh, can everyone see this okay? Okay, so the solution I came up with uh, was use Phoenix... Elixir, yes. 
And that'll solve this problem. It'll allow much more concurrent connections at the same time. Problem solved. That was elegant. <laughs> I think I just lost my MVP. Sorry. <laughs> oh, so. So, next question. Next question. Yeah. All right, so the next question, uh, there's another poor soul here. He wants to know how to, uh, how to perform, and performing and type safe collection. I assume the grammar is correct on that question? I'm not sure. uh, okay, so performing and type safe collection of value types in the early version of .NET 1.1. Uh, so that 1.1 is pre-generic, so he's probably in a world of hurt right now. Says he, he recently got access to a very old C sharp code base, meaning .NET 1.1 and C sharp 1.2, uh, which I guess if Johnsky would here, would tell you exactly what that added. Closures? <laughs> I don't know. Um, uh, and find places it could be improved. Um, so I guess he, he actually wants to improve the code base and not just throw it away, which would be my first reaction. Uh, it looks like a, it is like a window to the past when a, when a bow was the most powerful weapon. I never had the opportunity <laughs> to willingly code in C-sharp version less than C-sharp 2 before, so this is the first time you've seen C-sharp uh, 2, which is kind of like seeing like Java 3 for the first time. It's just a very bad thing to look at. And so this question is about uh, collections. So the C-sharp, this version, didn't have, any, uh, didn't have any generic collections whatsoever. And so he has a lot of these generic array lists. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, not generic, but I really list to just have everything as an object and wants to know if there's a better way for you to do this sort of thing uh, without dealing with a array list directly. Now, um, one possible way he could do this would just be to update his applications to .NET 2.0 and get generics. Like that's, you could just retarget it. That would also let you, let you do those sort of things. Uh, but that's not available to him. Um, so the way he could handle this uh, I actually worked at a product team where we had to deal with a bunch of, a bunch of collection types just like this. Uh, so the way I would deal with it, uh, there's an old set of collection objects in the system, let me just create a class, public class uh, foo collection. There's a really old set of collection classes you can deal with that come from the system dot collections namespace. Most people these days use like system dot collections dot generic or something like that, current, current, whatever. Uh, this is where you find the old array list. Uh, but right above that is actually this other one called collection base. And this is the one that we always had to use for our custom collection types. And because this is dot net, that means everything has to be a subclass and override sort of thing. And so this thing has a bunch of overridable methods, uh, including things like uh, on insert, on insert complete, uh, because I guess it comes after inserting or something like that. <laughs> and all sorts of methods do all these sort of things. So uh, these are the ones you would, you would override to be able to say, I'm returning this kind of object or that kind of object, that sort of thing. Uh, so this is the thing I remember us having to do. I don't have a funny answer for this one because there's nothing funny about C Sharp 1.1. One, one. <laughs> I'm sorry, C Sharp, uh, please quiet in the audience. Thank you. <laughs> all right, so... Uh, what do you got? Me. Well, all right. So what I would do in this scenario is uh, think about, OK, he can't, this person cannot use generics. But think about what generics are. If I have um, a class defined, say we have a public class foo of t, and it's a class, not just a foo. <laughs> and inside my program, I say something like um, var thing equals new foo of int. What's the C Sharp compiler doing? It's taking this generic type parameter, it's a parameter, and anywhere where it sees a T, so if I want to add a foo to something, the C Sharp compiler will simply come through that thing and replace the T with the type that you have substituted here, like integer. And it's a very simple operation that the compiler does for us, but what we could do is we could go to a collection class that was already implemented, implemented that could be very performant with integers. It just has a generic type parameter in it. And we could actually find the source code to a, a great collection like this. Just search GitHub <laughs> for a little project called CoreFX, which is uh, part of .NET, right? And inside of source, system.collections, we should find a source folder 
with the collections folder, with the generic folder, notice all the gen non-generic collections have disappeared, so things like array list are, are gone now, which is probably a good idea. I did not want to go to structural comparisons. I wanted to go into generic and find good old list of T. And then if I click raw, I can now copy and paste this into my IDE. <laughs> and it would take a little bit of time, but I could basically do what the compiler would do for me. So maybe I rename the class list of int, but then I go through it, and wherever there is a T, I simply replace that with integer. And I now have a data structure which can hold a variable number of integers and do that efficiently. It will do that in the back here. You can see I would have an array of integers and it would keep getting resized as, as integers were added to it. And of course, there would be some other things you would have to fix up to make the compiler completely happy. It's not just a simple replace t with int. Um, you would probably not implement i list of t, just implement i list and this one, uh, or just make it i enumerable, perhaps. But there is some interesting code inside of here. Um, and we could get rid of. Uh, code contracts and other things that we might not need in our application or keep them. But if we look at add, I was browsing through this code earlier and I just found it interesting. Let me do a search for add and we will find add an item. So what I add item does is it will check to see if that backing array is currently at capacity or not and ensure that there's enough capacity to store the next thing if we look at, so to me, that says, oh, we'll call this method ensure capacity, and it will expand the size of the array and maybe copy new items into a new array, something like that. Just want to do a quick search for ensure capacity, which is right here. And what confused me at first was this method actually doesn't do anything except recalculate a new capacity. And if I remember, the new capacity will be the current length of the list times two. So effectively, lists keep doubling in size until they reach about two gigabytes, and then your machine melts down. <laughs> but I'm looking at this and thinking, all right, where do they actually change the array? Where does the array grow? <laughs> and it's sneaky, because it's actually done in this property setter capacity. Boo. Yeah, not good. <laughs> if we look at capacity, somewhere inside of here is a lot of capacity. I may have to zoom out for a second to find it. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, look at the setter for that thing. It's inside of here where it will now create a new array based on this new capacity and array.copy items over. So that could still hurt performance, but you know, based, it's certainly going to still be better than boxing. And I think that question said he had sometimes thousands of integers and, or hundreds of thousands or something. And that's just so throwing, got a lot of numbers. Uh, yeah, of numbers. that's throwing garbage all over the heap. So this would uh, still be a better approach. But still, come through here, and every time there's a T, replace it with int, and you'd have a, a working dynamic list of integers. So Thank you. better than just finding a new job, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's also valid. <laughs> that, is, that is the question. All right, I'm going to wander over here. I'm looking at confused faces. Does anybody have any questions? Because we really want this to be fairly interactive. Oh, don't be so Norwegian. Come on, come on. Come on. <laughs> don't be so Norwegian. Nobody. All right. Anybody? You? Yeah? I'm going to pick on someone. Yes. Do you have any questions? Uh, uh, what is beer? Recursion. <laughs> yes. Did you have a question? I did. Yes. This question is for Jimmy. Um, what C sharp keyword am I thinking of? Yield. No, else. Oh. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Good I win. question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Jimmy's up. Please switch. I asked the question. Oh. Rob, you're screwing it up. Whatever. Come on, Rob. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Next question. How are people unit testing with Entity Framework 6 or 7, let's say, or whatever? Should you bother? I, I think you meant to say EF, Entity Framework Core 1.0. Oh, sorry. Yes. yes. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, this person is just starting out with unit testing and TDD in general. They want to add it to their workflow so they can add better software. But this person has already roadblocked themselves because they don't want to abstract EF away in a repository. Wonder why. Maybe Jimmy will know. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, he thinks iQueryable is a leaky abstraction. There's a lot of great posts out there on this subject. And then he shows some code where he's basically um, abstracting away EF. 
and abstracting away something that doesn't have the name repository in it, but <laughs> it's, uh, whoops, easily could. And maybe I'll let Jimmy go first on this one. I read the question <laughs> and you go. Are you just Googling how to do testing in Entity Framework? That's, that's also cheating. Yeah. I, but, I see what you're doing. But it's an article that I wrote. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that's why it's wrong. <laughs> oh, it's my turn. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, so the, one of the, it looks like one of the solutions he came up with or he read on, online was to create your own abstraction behind DB context, which is the, the main ORM thing of Entity Framework. Uh, and then that's the thing you go ahead and mock out and you're, uh, they're not using repositories, but think, using things called services. Would, this looks almost exactly like a repository, so I think some terms got to get mismatched or something like that. Um, so the original question was, how are people unit testing in any framework si six uh, and should you bother? Actually, I don't know how people are unit testing in any framework six. I don't really care how they're unit testing it because uh, the second part, should you bother? I don't think you should bother at all unit testing with it uh, whatsoever. A lot of the systems I work with, uh, when I have problems uh, in production, it's because my test didn't closely match how the production was actually working. And if I'm trying to do something with something like an in-memory repository or, or some kind of in-memory database or things like that, it's not executing the exact same sort of thing that would happen during production. So the more closely I can, match, I can make, my, uh, I can make my, my tests match how things actually work in production, then the more value I'm going to get out of it. Uh, so I actually over here got an example of a test, uh, not this ugly collection over here, that thing's horrible. Um, if I go look at how I typically use any framework, uh, let's see, <clears throat> let me find uh, a place where I'm actually using any framework behind the scenes here. Mm, that's a boring one, let's find one that's uh, more interesting. Um, yeah, here's, here we go. That's a more interesting one. Um, so I tend to split my, my, uh, my, my code into uh, commands and queries and individual request objects. So when I have something that's doing a very specific activity, I'm having that written in one, exactly one place. Uh, and so inside of that, I, uh, I'm ac actually using any sort of abstraction on top of any framework, uh, not even looking at DB contents. I'm using the actual, uh, the real, uh, DB context object that I created with uh, uh, in my application code. And inside of there, I'm just going ahead and uh, using it directly. So uh, I'm pulling off, in this case, courses, uh, doing some where and ordering, and then uh, using Automapper to project that information to some object and then returning some result. Uh, if you were trying to unit test this, that means you have to figure out what pieces you need to fake out. And that piece you fake out would probably be something like that right there, uh, await db.courses. And so instead of returning a real uh, I queryable, you'd return something like uh, a database back thing. And, uh, and then the projection, instead of projecting against a SQL version of things, it project against a in-memory version of things. Um, and so what I found is that, uh, that the I queryable logic in Entity Framework is insanely, com uh, insanely complicated. And I really want to make sure that thing is doing the right thing. Because uh, if I wrote a unit test with this, it would run the projection and link against an in-memory queryable, not against the crazy queryable that is any framework translating link into SQL, which is a seriously complicated thing to do. So the way my tests look in my application are trying to test things at this level via an integration test. And so that's what I have over here, is I have a test that uh, test my application by creating that, in this case, it was a command object to do something. Um, I send the command to that handler right here, and it runs the actual code behind the scenes in a transaction. And then finally over here, I do in a separate transaction to go and pull out to make sure I actually find the thing that was actually saved. Um, so this runs the actual real stuff behind the scenes, so uh, I can have the highest, um, highest, uh, confidence as possible that my code is doing the right thing. Now, on one system, I actually wrote all the unit tests for these as well. And I found that unit tests were doing basically the exact same thing as the integration tests. So I just wound up deleting the unit tests and, and keeping the integration tests, reserving unit tests for when I had places that weren't trying to call out to outside things whatsoever uh, for the actual domain model, things like that. So 
That's how I would unit test in any framework. I wouldn't. How would you ensure that the um, state of the database is in a, in a known state when you begin your test run? Oh, that is a tough thing. So the question is, how would I know that the state of the database uh, was in the correct state before anything started? Um, so there are a number of ways you can do that. Uh, the main techniques I've seen are things like uh, user transaction across the entire test run, so that I wrap the test in a transaction. At the end of the test, I roll the transaction back. So it ensures that it, at least it cleans up after itself. I don't like tests that clean up after themselves. I like tests that start things in a good state. And so what I do is uh, I use, uh, I actually just delete tables. I just cleared all the tables before I run each time. Uh, so I have another tool, another open source library actually, it's called, do -do -do -do. this one is called Respawn. And what Respawn does is it examines the schema of your database, follows the foreign key, constraints to see what the right order in which to delete tables is, which is all the leafs, and then the next level in, the next level in, so it's a depth first search of that graph. And as long as you don't do anything crazy, like have a table reference itself, which God help you if you do something like that, then you should be able to have that run and just before it starts the test, just deletes the tables in the right order. And from our profiling, we found that that manner is the fastest way to do things. Besides, uh, we tried... Uh, disabling all foreign key constraints, truncating all tables in random order, and then re-enabling constraints. But that was three times slower than just deleting things in the correct order. Uh, so this thing just figures it out once, builds up the, the, the list, and then runs it before every single test. I remember you and I talking, thank you. I remember you and I talking about this when you came out with this library, because you, I think, either asked me or asked Twitter, and you said, how do I do this on Postgres? Uh, yeah. And, and just, I just wanted to throw this out there, that Postgres allows you to delete everything in a schema. Um, and you can drop the entire schema. So if you put your tables or views or functions or whatever inside a schema, you can say drop the schema, cascade, and Postgres figures it out for you. And the reason I bring that up is I was curious if SQL Server does that too. Does anybody know? So we tried that one as well. Yeah. Um, we also found that creating, when, you, when, we, drop the, when we completely drop the schema, yeah. we have to recreate the schema, and that's still Slow. slower. So yeah. when I do these kind of tests where almost everything is integration tests, that means tests are slower because mm -hmm. I have to hit the database. So uh, I was trying to find as many performance optimizations as possible. So that works really great on smaller scenarios, but when I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these tests, then every little, like, every little second I shave off of it is less time. Uh, but it is a really cool thing. I like it. Yeah. I just want to do it. All right, we have one more question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, the question is, what data do I test on? Uh, whatever I set up. So in this case, uh, this one needs to have uh, a department ready to go. So it, it uh, gets a department, uh, this case from a, a tool called AutoFixture, uh, just makes up a department with junk in it, and then I save it, and then I'm using that over here to say, and my department should be that thing that I just saved over there. So my tests actually create the data it needs. If there's lookup data, that's another common question about lookup data, like the list of countries or, zip or postal codes or whatever. Uh, those things I, white, I whitelist to say, don't, don't clear out those tables because it's just lookup data as part of that deleting run. Yeah, so I just wanted to take a moment to apologize for sins of the past. <laughs> <laughs> it was about, uh, well, it was exactly, I guess, six years ago, Microsoft actually approached me and they said, we know you like test-driven development. We have this new thing called Entity Framework 4. Would you take a look at it and maybe write us a white paper about if you found it to be testable or not. And I said no, but they persisted. <laughs> so I eventually went through with it. And uh, at that time, the approach that I took was very much like that gentleman, which was what we're gonna do is build different types of abstractions around uh, what's built into Entity Framework. So using a repository to wrap the, um, I forget whatever the object context produced at that time, it wasn't DB set and using a unit of work to encapsulate the object context, which would now be a DB context, and showed a couple different approaches about how you could um, do this, but it's all rubbish now. I don't like doing any of that anymore. <laughs> I completely agree with Jimmy that you end up in a situation here where you do one of two things, the two approaches I sh showed. You either end up mocking stuff and you're not really testing your system, you're just testing the interaction and making sure that this method got called with this parameter, woohoo, big deal or you have in-memory data 
that link operators always work against, because if it compiles, it will work against in-memory data, but that's not necessarily true when you actually send it to SQL Server. So over the last uh, six, seven years, my um, viewpoints have changed, and I have to contact them and see how to take this down. I think you just, <laughs> you just have to click no right there. <laughs> Yeah, well, it was Disclaimer EF4. at the top. That's what yeah, you need. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think you should yeah. just click no right there. <laughs> <laughs> everyone, <laughs> everyone in the room, go to this page <laughs> and click no. <laughs> Is, uh, <laughs> oh. So while Scott's typing that, this is uh, one of the reasons I picked this question. <laughs> Very good. One of the reasons I picked this question is I read a really interesting blog post by a really handsome and interesting guy about <laughs> repositories <coughs> on top of unit of work. And it was in response to a Stack Overflow question. And oddly, OK, so here's a surprise. I'm the one that wrote that post. But you anyway, said handsome. It's, <laughs> I know. I had to. Someone's got to say it. Anyway, that is still, to this day, my most popular post. Oh, yeah. mm. And I kind of ranted a little bit, but I want to ask you guys about that. Because to me, the bigger question here is why are you wrapping EF with a repository? Oops. And does everybody understand what, that, what I just said? Because like, Unity Framework is unit of work, right? You have a DB context, yeah. tracks your objects, and then you flush it at some point in a transaction to the database. All those objects get saved and whatnot. But if you put that into a repository, you're mixing your patterns to the point where you're, if you're passing in the data context or the DB context, you got no idea what objects are sitting on that waiting to be transacted. You know what I mean? Mm. So I wanted you to actually go into your example of um, command and query objects, because I think that's fascinating, if you don't mind really quickly doing that. A little, but OK. Well, oh. if, you you don't mind. A, if you need a minute to bring it up, I could uh, oh, you have expand on this topic just a little bit. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, please. So when I started developing with Angular 1, I wanted to unit test my front end code. And I found myself in a very similar situation, same situation I had in C Sharp code with Entity Framework. I was in a situation where, with Angular, the idea was isolate your controllers, isolate your controllers, unit test your controllers so that they're not calling into other services and trying to make HTTP calls. So uh, the team I was working with, we tried this at the time. What we would do is a controller, when it was uh, instantiated, it would call into a service that would make an HTTP call. And so what we would try to do is provide a fake service or a mock service that provided fake beta data back to the controller and write a search that the controller would put the data on the right property so it would presumably be data bound to the screen. But what I, found that, what I found was that those tests were completely ineffective. We were always having things breaking because most controllers are actually pretty simple. They ask for data, and they get the data back, and they put it into a property. And what we really need to, needed to test was not the controller in isolation. What we found to be of a lot more value was testing uh, the controller and the services it interacted with and actually testing that that interaction worked. And so after a few months, we switched our strategy and said, OK, we're not going to ever, ever provide a fake or a mock service to inject into a controller inside of our unit tests. Instead, we're going to inject the real service and find out if the controller and that thing actually work together. And instead, Angular 1 had this, ha has this neat ability where you can mock out the HTTP connection on the back end. So, uh, a lot of people would look at that. We had this discussion, is it a true unit test? Because the unit test is instantiating the controller, and it's using a real service, and the service is actually really trying to make an HTTP call. It's just that I had this mock backend that would provide fake data. But I can tell you that after finishing that project, or looking at that project after we switched the strategy, we were probably writing 70% less test code and finding a lot more actual bugs in the software than we ever had before. So it was a uh, very similar to this situation. I'm sure someone from the BDD community would raise their hand like, I told you so. But, <laughs> nah, that is not me. So you're saying something about commands and queries, something, something, something? Um, yeah, so one of, the, one, of, one of the journeys I've gone through in the whole like DDD realization uh, is trying to take some of these patterns to their, to their logical conclusion. And one of the things we found is that, uh, um, that one of the good things 
uh, from the, the whole CQRS, the Command Query Responsibility Segregation Movement, was uh, by breaking things down in our system between commands and queries, we can really kind of rally around those patterns and build out some interesting, uh, interesting things from those things. So uh, what I'm showing here is um, I've got, uh, even my, my application is, is, is split and organized based on the kind of features I'm working with. So as opposed to my, my, my application being organized by layer, so don't, uh, like a, a queries folder, a view models folder, a, a controllers folder, and instead I'm organizing everything together based on what they're trying to do. So even here on the right, I've got uh, views and the actual C-sharp classes that deal with them uh, right next to each other. Uh, so that if I'm working on some feature, I'm always working on those two files together and not having to jump around my solution a lot. And then the actual uh, queries and commands themselves, if I actually look at the, uh, let's say this is the instructor control, oh no, that's the instructor uh, UI, there we go. Uh, the, control that, the controller itself doesn't really have a lot of things going on. It's just dealing with queries like this, and then down here, commands and then sending them down to this, uh, this intermediate or this mediator object to actually dispatch those to an individual function that, that represents doing that actual work. And then the actual work is represented by individual command objects and query objects. This query object represents uh, a query to, well, it's kind of funny because it returns a command because that's the form object. And the validation is represented here as well, uh, validating the query, things like it needs to have a not null ID, um, and then the command itself is represented as an individual object that represents all the, all the data that you need to uh, process that command. So the properties that you see on the screen are all individual uh, properties on here that uh, line up to uh, the different form fields on the screen. And then the last piece is looking at the, query, the handlers behind this. Uh, the query handler is taking that request and returning the response. And this one is actually somewhat complicated, or at least looks kind of like it's complicated. Uh, so it's doing some, getting something of instructors, projecting out into this uh, form object, and then populating some associated data on here. Um, looks pretty complicated, but everything that has to deal with that, that operation is just in this one spot. So if you're one of those like store procedure people, you could call it out to a store procedure here as opposed to uh, having it all done through link. And then the command side, it's separated out as well, so that everything that is required to uh, process that command is then again in just this one individual spot. So here is all the whatever I need to do to actually process that command, uh, adding an instructor if it's a new one, or getting the one out if it's an existing one, setting the data, whatever I need to do again, it's all just completely encapsulated in this one method. Uh, which makes it pretty easy to test because now I have this one sort of interface I go through of passing in a request, getting a response, and making sure that that thing did the thing it was supposed to do. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, it's kind of funny, isn't it? Um, so this is, a, this is an edit page, an add edit page. So in any edit page, you make an initial request to get the existing data and put that into a form. And so what I do is I model that form on the screen as an individual view model object. So it turns out when I'm actually making the query for the edit page, the result is the command that represents the form. And then when I do the form post, the command is then bound up from the request information uh, to that same object. And it might be easier to see on the controller because on, here we go, uh, you'll see that the edit returns a command object. And that command object is the view model. And that same command object is then the input for the form post over here. So, so having that duality. On this post, to get like a command, so already you're just like cheating a little bit and sending it. Yeah, I used to call these like view models or something. It'd be like create edit or create edit view model. Uh, but it, I, I then renamed it based on the intent of what it was meant to be. So it's, it's the query returns the command for the edit page. Kind of funny. Well, the big, thing, uh, the big thing I'm going for here is that I want to make sure that the, the model being used to build the form is the exact same model I'm using to 
bind against the form variables. But having those two things the same thing, I don't ever get it, I don't ever get it off. It's always going to be the same thing. But as far as what you name it, I mean, I don't really care. Then name it something else. I mean, uh, the important thing was that uh, we wanted to be consistent in the names. Uh, so just basically pick something and stick to it. And if you change it, fix it everywhere. Uh, Scott, did you have anything to add? Yeah. All right. No. Um, Sorry. Shall, we, shall we move on to the next question? Did you guys have anything else to say about this stuff? OK. Uh, so your turn. Yep. Take it. Uh, OK, so this question is on uh, Angular 2, which I think uh, you know a little about. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, so this one says, uh, is there no equivalent to $scope.emit or $scope.broadcast in Angular 2? I know the event emitter functionality, but as far as I understand, that will just emit an event to the parent HTML element. What if I need communication between the FX period siblings or between a component in the root of the DOM and elements nested several levels deep? Fascinating. Good question. <laughs> yeah, so... All right, let's bring up something. So I can tell you this, in Angular 2, and this is also kind of true of Angular 1, I think this fellow is talking about a page that might have a little widget up here that maybe represents the current user status, and then he's got some complex UI where buried deep down inside of here, there might be a component where the user could maybe log in or select a checkbox or do something that's going to change their status or raise an alert or do something. And we need to communicate that information back up to this component. And we really don't want those to be tied together. And in Angular 1, it was possible to use scope.emit, which is sort of a broadcasting mechanism to say, I have this event, and I just want to send it out up the tree or down the tree with scope.broadcast. And you could have these events traveling through your system and listen to them from other controllers. And that was one way that two controllers that didn't know anything about each other could communicate. But it never really was a great idea, <laughs> at least for me. Actually, I tried using dollar sign scope emit and scope broadcast to do a few things, and I, I never liked it. There's, there's another way to deal with this in both Angular 1 and Angular 2. Actually, there's a couple different ways. But before I talk about that, I'll just show you a, a slightly different scenario. It's, it's the theme for Angular 2, which is if you have a parent component, and inside of that are child components, it is very easy for this parent component to own some sort of model. And it's very easy for that parent component to take that model and delegate pieces of it to subcomponents so they can render small pieces of it. But we might, we might not want those child components to mutate that model. We might just want them to display information and then tell us if the user interacted in a way that the model should be mutated. So in Angular 2, there's a convenient mechanism for these child components to essentially raise an event, just like we would have in .NET, that the parent can listen to. And then the parent should be responsible for mutating that model. And the code looks something like, actually, I have to find a more specific file here, which would be da, 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 da. Oh, yeah, this one. So here's a little component. So imagine a, a page that's going to display a, a few panels with some movie information. And I want this one movie component just to be able to display a single movie out of 10 or 20 or however many appear on the page. And Angular now is Angular 2 anyway. Um, they really like all, all the symbols, different symbols that they can ever find in the, on the keyboard to use. So we have a, an at input, which you can kind of think like, uh, so this is TypeScript. And, but this syntax will actually be part of a future ECMAScript standard. That's uh, known as a decorator now. And you can think of it kind of like an attribute in .NET, except attributes in .NET are very passive. They provide metadata to a class, and the compiler takes it and bakes it into the assembly. But in order for that metadata to be useful, some piece of code has to come along and inspect it and act on it. Whereas decorators in JavaScript are really quite powerful and will be useful for metaprogramming because essentially, and I know this is a tangent, <laughs> that input decorator will actually be able to execute during uh, transpilation or at runtime when the browsers do this natively and take its target. So there's a target here, uh, that component target. Oops, that was not expected. It is. Component is attached to this class, 
<coughs> component, you can think of it a as a function that will actually be able to execute and modify that class. So it could dynamically add members, it could remove things, it can add metadata, whatever it wants to do. Same thing with input. But this is a very explicit way of saying, providing like a public API from this component. It's a way of saying, I want my parent to give me a movie. And I have an output to tell the outside world that the user is trying to change the rating of this movie. And it's almost like an event handler of T. So it's an, an event emitter in Angular 2, but I'm going to raise an event and pass along a number, and then the parent can decide what to do with that value. But this doesn't work at all. In the scenario I had over here on the left, if I'm trying to communicate between a component way down here and a component way up here. So the solution, I think, for Angular 2, there's, there's a couple different solutions, but they almost always involve a service. Um, and this is something that I did in Angular 1 quite a bit. Hopefully, there's Angular fans out here. <laughs> but if I have an application and there's a whole bunch of widgets, controllers, components, whatever they are on the screen, and they have to coordinate somehow to know when the user status is updated or something like that. The solution is almost always a service, because services in Angular are singletons, which sounds bad. But singletons aren't too bad in JavaScript, because it's single-threaded. We're not going to have to worry about threading issues. And they're stateless, too, right? So they shouldn't Well, allegedly... so that's, uh, where, well, that's where it comes in interesting. <laughs> uh, a stateful service, which does sound terrible, but uh, uh, th there's easy ways in unit tests to just completely reboot an ang Angular application before every test so that you're always starting from scratch. And I think what's important for people to understand in both Angular, and Angular 1 and Angular 2 is that a service, we tend to think of services as things that will communicate back to the web server or provide some sort of infrastructure or talk to the geolocation thing in the browser, all that stuff. But in reality, a service can be anything. A service could even be a model. So a model that I want to share inside of the application. So you could imagine if there's a service that exposes an API to uh, add things and an API to remove things and behind the scenes. There's some sort of data structure in here. Hopefully, these drawings are helpful. <laughs> well, this, since the service is a singleton, I can inject that into any component or any other service in the application, and they're all dealing with the same object, and therefore they can bind themselves to the same pieces of state here. So if all I need is a sim simple mechanism to say, let's say the user profile has changed and the user has now logged in, if all I need is a simple mechanism to be able to propagate that information around, well, if everyone is looking at that information in the service, um, they will know when the user profile changed because of when something happened. In, in Angular 2, we could uh, also put the event emitter here on the service and actually have a service raise events that people could subscribe to and so forth. And, and I think that can be an interesting architecture, but uh, there, there does come a point where you might want to take a slightly more formal approach for the events that are flowing around the system and use something more like an event aggregator pattern. And, uh, there is another JavaScript framework, not Angular, that perhaps this person could consider. <laughs> a framework called Aurelia that has this kind of stuff built in. If I flip over here, so this is an Aurelia application, and I just want to show you that it has an event aggregator service. And what I can do with a service is actually define classes like uh, contact viewed or contact updated, if we look at them then anyone who's, who has used a message bus in C Sharp or end service bus or something like that might start to see where this becomes familiar, right? I have types defined for messages that I want to flow around. So that when, bah, that was not the expected result there. There we go. So that when someone does something interesting like view a specific contact, and I need other components in the application to be able to do that, then I actually want to go out to my message bus and publish a message that this contact was viewed and pass along some state information that can be inspected. And then some other component. Let's take the one over here. Can say it wants to walk up to that event aggregator and subscribe to events that are 
you know, those specific class instances uh, or that class symbol, Con contact viewed, contact updated. I think that's a nice approach to solve this too. Did any of that make any sense? <laughs> What's C sharp keyword am I thinking of? <laughs> Yield? A wait. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, I had, a, I had an answer too. Um, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I actually do remember using the event emit or scope emit on one project. And it's, mm. it, Seemed really good at first, and then uh, about two months down the road, it was like we could not figure out how anything hooked up to anything else. Yes. It was a global event aggregator that went off like a, just a string key. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, just in general, not a not a great not a great thing to use. All right, so that's all I got. What is React? Oh, I actually have an, uh, <laughs> an example using it. Uh, React is uh, well, it's just really a, a kind of a. Does anyone here not know what React is? I mean, I think at this point everyone should know what React is. No? Okay. Um, so React is a, a JavaScript library that really focuses on the, the view side and really looks at taking, uh, taking an input and then building out of your HTML from that. And it really tries to be smart about things. So it will, uh, anytime the model changes, it will just ask itself to re-render and then do some smart diffing to see what's changed so that the DOM only gets the new uh, pieces of HTML in there. It's kind of funny too because the first Angular app I did, uh, we wound up building the uh, building the interactions in a very React flow, but React didn't exist. So every time I clicked a button on the screen, I would make an AJAX request to the back end. The back end would return the new JSON object, but that was my model, and I would completely replace the old scope with a new scope, and then it would re-render itself. Uh, but that's actually a very bad thing to do, it turns out, in Angular, just to replace its <laughs> scope anytime you want. Mm. Uh, but it was the way I, I thought was the easiest way to work with, which was the server is a source of truth for my model, and all I wanted to do is just take the new model and just figure out what needs to be changed uh, based on just re-rendering itself. Um, so had React existed, I would just use that, but it didn't, so we had the janky way, like physically janking the screen because it was re-rendering everything. <laughs> Eh? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's JavaScript. There's memory leaks. Yeah. Uh, I think you're next to ask me the question. To ask a question? This plant question. All right. The question is right up your ballpark. <laughs> up my ballpark, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm using AutoMapper, which I understand is uh, the most popular open source library by a uh, non-Microsoft, uh, also non-web version, not JSON related in the Northwest Hemisphere. <laughs> <laughs> AutoMapper in an ASP.NET MVC application, I was told I should move the AutoMapper.create map elsewhere as they, or it, has a lot of overhead. I'm not sure how to design my application to put these calls in just one place. I have a web layer, a service layer, a data layer. Each is a, its own project. I use Ninject. I'll utilize AutoMapper in both the web and service layers. So what are, what are your setup for AutoMapper's create map? Where do you put it? How do you call it? You, you just took the text straight from there, didn't you? <laughs> like, grammar errors and all. Okay. I think, I, I think you have enough rep to go fix the grammar, don't you? No. Uh, I could do that. Okay. Well, you, you work on the question. I'll try to... I'll try to uh, okay. So I get this, I get this question uh, quite a bit about where, where should I put my configuration. Um, so I'm, I got a sample app, actually. To yeah, we can switch. Sample app over here, and uh, most of most applications I work with have some sort of global startup piece. Um, in the uh, .NET MVC core or ASP.NET core, there's like a program main because that's not going to be confusing. Where all the <laughs> setup is going to be. Um, Oh, AutoMapper. Uh, I assume everyone's heard of it. I'm just that kind of person. <laughs> um, it, it started off as a really dumb thing on a project uh, about eight years ago. We, were, we wanted to do this whole everything is a view model thing, but uh, I knew I was going to have to create all this code to map from my domain model to these dumb view models, the DTOs. So I thought, why, 
why don't I just have something do that mapping for me and just fill in the data? Uh, and to my surprise, no one had created this before, so I could say I was the first one to come up with, well, actually, not the idea, because a lot of people afterwards said, oh, I thought of that, but I didn't do it. I'm like, that's right. I did it. Uh, uh, anyway, so, uh, yeah, it's just, a, it's just a dumb little library to map from uh, one object to the other, uh, really with the use case of flattening things out into DTOs, that kind of thing. Uh, so usually in your application, there's always uh, some place that has all the startup stuff, uh, like this is like application start, and you'll see that this is all this is where it's it's configuring all the other stuff in the application for the first time. So wherever that is for your application, that's where you'd want to put this sort of initializ initialization as well. Uh, they also asked a couple other questions about how to use it, th that sort of stuff. Uh, so it's actually pretty straightforward. You just go uh, your uh, initialization is going to start with mapper dot initialize, oh, this is a very old version where I have it deprecated. It's not anymore, I promise. Uh, <laughs> and this is where I put all my initialization. So in, as part of this, you can do config.createMap to create the mapping configuration from one class to another. So if I have class foo and class foo DTO, and there's some data as part of that. I, my applications have a lot of foo objects in, in, in them. I don't know about you. <laughs> and yeah, value. Okay. Uh, then I would create this mapping configuration between the uh, first one and the second one, foo DTO. Uh, so what that's doing behind the scenes is just uh, uh, inspecting both of those types, figuring out those things two can map with each other, and then uh, caching some configuration about how it should actually execute and perform that mapping. Um, and if I want to actually execute the map somewhere else in my application code, I would just do mapper.map. .map. Um, I know it's lined out, but that was a mistake that I have atoned for. These methods all still exist. Uh, where I can map uh, from foo to foo DTO. Foo DTO. Uh, passing in a foo object, and then returns five. And this returns a foo DTO object from the result. And the foo DTO's value will be five, hopefully, if everything's gone right behind the scenes. Um, so if this gets to be too much, in some of my applications, I have a whole bunch of these sort of things, uh, a whole bunch of these maps around. Um, it would be a little bit of a pain to try to put them all here. So I've created a, a way for us to um, gather specific sets of configuration together so that uh, you, know, you have different configuration uh, for different use cases all kind of tied together. Uh, so an example of that, if I go pull open these feature folders, you'll see that uh, not only do they include the uh, C-sharp command query and view files, and they also include the automapper profile and also the controller itself. So everything related to that thing is going to be all in that one folder. So if I pop open one of these profiles, You'll see that uh, I'm using uh, this automapper a concept of a profile, uh, which contains its own configuration. So in here, I'm creating the maps for all of the maps inside of this one individual uh, file for this one feature for courses. Hmm. And I think what I wind up doing to automatically pull in all these pieces together is do to do to do to do. Um, I, f I go through and look for all of the things that are these profile objects. I go ahead and create them using reflection. And then as part of my mapper configuration, I just go ahead and suck them all in and say, go ahead and add all those profiles all together. Uh, this is showing the instance space version. Um, when I first created AutoMapper, my boss looked at it as like, oh, that's a fantastic idea. Uh, maybe you should make it static, though, because not everyone wants static. And my reaction was, whatever. I'll do static anyway. Uh, and then so just recently, I was able to not just have static, kind of instance-based versions. And that's what you see here. So I can hmm. instantiate one of these guys, uh, put it all in there, and I can use my dependency injection to be able to uh, configure that to use dependency injection to have those different things. So if I need to have different configuration for different scenarios, I would just have different ones of these objects that I would then create mappers based on those different scenarios. Uh, but that's how I do it, is like that. That's the way it is. <laughs> we didn't have as much money, so I only had Walk DMC Gosh, growing up. Bob. Sorry. Did you have anything to add to that? I had a question. I, does it run under RC2 yet? 
It does. All right. Yeah, it runs on uh, net standard 1.1, which I will not go into what that means. I thought that was going to be my question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it runs on net standard 1.1, so if I go up and pull up... Uh, <laughs> that's for my last thing. <laughs> uh, no, go to a new tab. Uh, new, newj.org slash packages <laughs> slash automapper. <laughs> that was not my term, by the way. That was Miguel de Casa. Uh, the latest new beta version which can only be called beta because it depends on pre-release packages of other stuff, supports net standard 1.1, which will be anything Xamarin related, uh, not Silverlight 5. Sorry, you Silverlight fans out there. Uh, it'll support .NET 4.5, of course, and then just about anything else under the sun, Xbox, if you do love for Xbox, I guess. Uh, it supports pretty much any of those platforms. OK, it's about time to drink beer. Um, we have time for maybe one or two questions. Let's go in the back row area. Anyone have any questions for either of these handsome gentlemen that have more hair than me? <laughs> they want to drink beer too? Oh, you got one. Okay. What's the most common pitfall when using AutoMapper? Uh, the most common pitfall, I, well, there's, there's two big ones. One of them is uh, I only built it to do the translation from complex domain model to stupid looking DTO. Uh, a lot of people try to go the other direction. It just really wasn't built for that scenario. Um, so it works in simple cases. Like uh, I, I may have a very simple case like uh, create. Uh, in this case, creating it will just map it from the form to the object because it's very simple. Uh, but for more complex scenarios, it won't. So if you find yourself having a lot of custom configuration, just like stop what you're doing and just hard code it because that's more obvious. Uh, don't put a lot of configuration in there. Um, the other one that people run into a lot, and I don't know how to really get around it, is over in the profile object over here. They won't call create map. They'll call mapper.createMap, which is the wrong one, and uh, won't work either. So don't do that. Make sure you call the, the one up here. Uh, the latest 5.0 and the new 5.0 release is when it's coming uh, June 27th, evidently, because that's when .NET Core will actually RTM. Whoa. For whatever your definition of RTM means. <laughs> <laughs> Were you supposed to the say first reap the money? I don't know. Uh, then it will be fi that's yeah. uh, I'm, I ha basically have to wait for .NET Core to be released because I am depending on pre-release packages, and so that means I have to be labeled as pre-release as well. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Appreciate it. Uh, appreciate you guys coming out, and uh, it's just on time. We just finished up. Uh, if you have any questions for these guys. No, we're going to go drink beer. So <laughs> <laughs> see you guys. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.